Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I am sure that you will agree that the study of the book of Revelation is so enlightening and certainly helps us to understand what's going on around us even more. In fact, when Jack ended with tape two, I wanted to know more about the drug issue. It's a menace that's encircling the globe. And in fact, I have a question for him right up front on this tape. Jack, uh, what does the drug issue have to do with the tribulation hour? Can you enlighten us a little bit more? Uh, it's one of the great signs, Rex, so that Jesus Christ coming is at the door. Well, let's just look into the book for a moment. The closing chapters of the book of Revelation graphically portray the terrible consequences of mankind's enchantment with drugs. What we're presently witnessing is only the beginning of the coming disintegration of society during the tribulation period. Revelation 18.23 states, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. The Greek word for sorceries is, as already mentioned on tape two, Thotamachia. Thus, the explanation is, by their enchantment with drugs, or getting high on drugs, were all nations deceived. This is the result of mankind's first mass usage of drugs. Now there's a change in the next occurrence of the word translated sorcerers. This change reveals a class of people who are doomed and is found in chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The Greek word for sorcerers in this text is phatomachias, whereas the word phatomachia meant enchantment with drugs, phatomachias means the enchanter with drugs, the pusher or seller of drugs. This text plainly declares that eight distinct groups of people will never get into heaven, but will rather be assigned to the lake of fire, a description of a literal hell. One of these groups, those who are enchanters or pushers of drugs. Oh, what a solemn warning against having anything to do with the soul-damning drug traffic of the present hour. But wait, there is another reference to sorcerers in this book of the Bible, chapter 22, verse 15. For without, without heaven, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh the lie. Here again, the word is phonomachias. Although the word is the same as found in chapter 21, verse 8, it has a deeper meaning in this context. By extension, it includes both the drug pusher and user. Take notice. These individuals are kept out of heaven. Heaven wouldn't be heaven very long if they were admitted. There's only one place to which they can go, and that's the place of eternal separation from the presence of God, the place prepared for Satan and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. The Bible is explicit in stating that there is no heaven for those who refuse to repent of their sins. In hell they will keep on sinning forever. They will never repent or get saved there. Notice also that of the six groups named in chapter 22 verse 15, sorcerers or drug pushers and users occupy second place immediately following the term which describes outlaws as wild dogs. Oh, God hates this sin. It. An additional word, witchcraft, with the same meaning as found in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The word translated witchcraft in our English Bible is again phatomachia in the Greek. We also see that this sin is number six 
in this listing of 17 kinds of sinners who shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The drug user and the drug pusher are both excluded from heaven. Is there no hope or escape from the clutches of this binding habit? Praise God. There is a source of liberation. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Beloved, it's by the way of the cross of Calvary that Jesus has broken Satan's grip. Now, when any guilty sinner calls upon him for salvation, Jesus Christ immediately frees that person from the shackles of sin and death which bind him. Try him. There's no limit to the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jack, do I love that. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful to know that the Lord can deliver us no matter what the habit is? I have some more questions that I would like to present to you before Jack goes into chapter 10. See if you can answer them first, and if you cannot, he's going to help you to have the answer for all of these 10 questions. What is Theophanes and Christophanes? What is Christ's threefold ministry? Did you know that he had a threefold ministry? Not just one. What significant part do clouds play in Christ's ministry? This is an exciting answer in this chapter. What does the rainbow symbolize and why is it upon Christ's head? What is the little book and who opens it? Where, when, and why does the lion of the tribe of Judah roar? What does the term, there should be no more, mean? What is meant by the mystery of God? What causes a sweet and bitter taste in the Apostle John's mouth? And why should you look for honey in this chapter? Help us out here, Jack. I will, Rexel, and I love this chapter because it is loaded with sweetness and honey. Because in chapter 10, we again discover a parenthesis similar to the one of chapter 7. Between the sixth and seventh seal judgments, there was a lull before the storm. Now we experience a break between the sixth and the seventh trumpet blasts. The study of this parenthetical period continues through chapter 11, verse 14. Verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. This angel is Christ. Remember, Christ was and is eternal. In fact, he was before the angels because he created them. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, Colossians 1.16. As I believe that such Theophanies and Christophanies were appearances of Christ throughout the Old Testament, usually in the form of angelic manifestations. Now this angel of Jehovah has always acted and worked as a deity. Proof, Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction was he afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. On three occasions to this point in time, we have observed this angelic messenger in action. In chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, he holds back the tides of judgment for a special hour of grace. In chapter 8, verse 5, he stands as the messenger of the covenant, pouring out the fire of judgment upon the earth. Now he appears again in the text before us. In the first appearance, he's a prophet. In the second, a priest. And now in the third, he appears as a king. This is the threefold ministry of the Savior. Hence, this angel is Jesus. As he comes down from heaven, he is clothed with a cloud, has a rainbow upon his head, exhibits a countenance that shines like the sun, and his feet like under pillars of fire. What do these attributes signify? First, Christ in his deity is usually surrounded by a cloud. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Psalm 97, 2. Bickering Israel witnessed the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Exodus 16, 10. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments of Judgment, he descended in a thick 
cloud. Immediately the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. Exodus 19, verses 9 and 16. At the completion of the tabernacle, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, Exodus 40, 34. This was the cloud of the Lord, Exodus 40, 38. On the Mount of Transfiguration, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, Matthew 17, 5. When Christ ascended to heaven, a cloud received him out of their sight, Acts 1, 9. And as he departed, he said, They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, Luke 21, 27. When he returns, he will come with clouds, and every eye shall see him, Revelation 1, 7. Second, the God of all eternity made a covenant with Noah, placing a rainbow in the sky as a symbol of his mercy. The rainbow pictures mercy in the midst of judgment. Ah, who but the Lord could wear it? Third, Christ is often pictured as one who has a shining face as unto the sun. In fact, Saul of Tarsus met this one whose countenance was as his light, Herod, and as Saul journeyed. He came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Acts 9, 3. Finally, Christ's feet as pillars of fire. Picture judgment, as we saw in chapter 1, verse 15. Verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. This verse pictures Christ preparing to take control of the earth and sea, which have always been rightfully his. He created them. For all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. When Christ came to take control 1,900 years ago, he was rejected, crucified, and buried. But he rose again. Since then, he has been at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for his people, Hebrews 7.25. At a given moment, he will rise from the throne and make a request. The picture is presented in Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. God says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Then Christ says, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Immediately the father asks his son to make a request, saying, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. At the granting of the request, the Lord Jesus sets his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and unrolls the scroll or book which contains the record of the judgments he plans to unleash. Verse 3, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. This is the cry of the lion of the tribe of Judah, Hebrews seven fourteen. Immediately prior to executing the judgments listed in the book, he cries loudly or roars as a lion to warn of impending danger. Rexella, other portions of Scripture also speak of his roaring when he comes as the judge of the universe. Hosea 11.10 states, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Joel 3.16 adds, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Again, Amos 1, 2. The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. 
when the Lord roars, seven thunders utter their voices. Though thunder is usually associated with judgment, no attempt will be made to explain the meaning, since God forbids it in the next verse. Verse 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Hmm. Well, someday we'll know. For the present, however, God commands that this one portion of Scripture be kept secret. Verses 5 and 6. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer or literally no waiting period. Here we see our God taking an oath. Though this is forbidden in our dispensation of grace, it was not under the law, the age of Moses, and will not be during the tribulation and kingdom periods. This oath is by the eternal creator based upon his creation of heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things contained within them. The oath is that time shall be no longer, or more accurately, that there should be no more delay. The time has come for the seventh trumpet blast, and nothing can stop it or hinder its execution. There will be no further waiting. Ooh. Verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The seventh angel does not sound at this point, but rather in Revelation 11.15. When he does, all the warnings of the prophets concerning judgment will be fulfilled. Then the mystery of God will be finished, and the tribulation hour will end. At that time the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, Isaiah 1, 9. When this knowledge floods the land, the mystery disappears. The Old Testament prophets could not understand all the scriptures concerning this mystery. They could not see God's timetable as we can. 1 Peter 1.10 and 11 describe their situation. The text states, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. This glory has to do with the return of Christ to earth to establish his millennial kingdom. Though the prophets knew this was happen as evidenced by their many predictions, they did not clearly foresee the 2,000 year interval between the time of Christ's rejection and establishment of his kingdom. Still, their writings reflected the fact that a suffering Savior preceded a ruling king, as can be seen in Psalm 22, verses 14 to 16. This is Christ speaking prophetically concerning his suffering and crucifixion. Listen to him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Here it is. They pierced my hands and my feet. Crucifixion. Again, Isaiah mentions a cross preceding the crown in chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Hear him. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Calvary. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, on him, the iniquity of us all. The centuries have now passed, and in our study we are presently at the moment in history when the mystery of God is finished. The final pieces of the puzzle have now fallen into place. The prophetic time clock has struck midnight or the zero hour. There will be no further delay. The final trumpet is ready to sound, and the tribulation hour is about to come to an end. There is great rejoicing as the heavenly hosts proclaim the joyous news. Listen to them. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 11.15 Some may find it strange that the tribulation hour ends in chapter 11 especially in the light of the fact that chapters 18 and 19 contain seven more bold judgments, and also that the Lord Jesus Christ does not return until chapter 19, verses 11 to 16. The answer is so simple. Chapters 12 through 19, 15 run concurrently with the judgments already discussed. They are a repeat of chapters 6 through 11. Actually, the simplistic outline of the book of Revelation should be as mentioned in chapter 1, verse 19, the past, chapter 1, the present, chapters 2 and 3, the future, chapters 4 through 22, listen, with chapters 5 through 11 and 12 through 19, 15, running neck and neck. Don't miss that. That's an important point. Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. At this point, John is told to take the book out of the hand of Christ who stands upon the sea and upon the earth. This he does. Verse 9, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly better. But it shall be in thy mouth, sweet as honey. The little book John is commanded to take is either all or a portion of the Word of God dealing with the judgments. John obeys. Verse 10, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. This verse pictures a devouring of God's Word assimilating it through study and personal application. At times, it is both sweet and bitter. The prophet Jeremiah stated, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Chapter 15, verse 16. The psalmist also declared in Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now, John, following the angel's instructions, also finds the word of God sweet as honey. This is because he can see the light at the end of the tunnel. As he reads the prophecies, he envisions the established kingdom, the bride sitting by the side of the bridegroom, and the peace and prosperity prevalent in the land with Satan bound and sin abolished. What sweetness! What blessing! Yet, as John learns of the remaining judgments still to be released, the word becomes bitter in his digestive tract. How true for us today. How precious is the good news of the gospel. Jesus loves sinners. He shed his blood for the remission of sins. By trusting in Christ, one obtains eternal life. Yea, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, John 336. However, this message becomes a bitter pill to swallow when one realizes that the rejection of the beautiful gospel appeal brings judgment. For he that believeth not shall be damned.
Mark 16, 16. Get in on the honey. Believe and be saved. It's for all, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. This bittersweet message is now about to be propagated by John. Verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. John does this, as we will discover in the remaining chapters. He is faithful unto the end, proclaiming both the good news and the bad, presenting both the sweet and the bitter. He warns of the remaining judgments the seven bowls or vials, the great white throne judgment, and the dissolution of the present heavens and earth. May we be found as faithful in proclaiming all of God's holy word. For God commands that we preach the word, saying, Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, Second Timothy 4.2. Jack, what an exhortation. And I'm sure that you are finding as you're listening to Jack that the book of Revelation is not so hard to understand. And as we go into chapter 11, I know that your heart is going to be revitalized once again. And you're going to want to see if you can answer these questions just prior uh, to Jack giving us that chapter. What is the abomination of desolation and why is it one of the vilest acts all of history? Is it possible to prove that the tribulation period is exactly seven years long to the day? I wasn't sure about that one myself until Jack explained it to me, to the day. There are three possible candidates as far as the two witnesses are concerned. Who are they? What miracles will the two witnesses perform and how will the whole world react toward those miracles? Why is Jerusalem called Sodom in this chapter? Is global satellite television depicted in this soon to be fulfilled prophecy? What happens <laughs> at the beer and salami festival? What causes one of the greatest earthquakes in history? Is foxhole religion practiced during these horrendous days? What do Revelations chapter 11 and 19 have in common? Do you know the answers to those questions? I'm sure you will in just a moment. Jack? Oh, Rick, so I feel like teaching and preaching, so let's get right into this. Chapter 11 of the book of Revelation deals with the spiritual life of Israel, while chapter 12 describes her persecution. Since one needs a place for communication with God, we see that a temple has been erected. Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. The measuring reed like unto a rod is most likely from the breaks of the Jordan Valley and is probably about 10 feet in length. Through the angel, John is told to measure the temple of God and the altar as well as the people of Israel concerning their spirituality. Now, the first place of worship ever built was called Solomon's Temple and is discussed in 1 Chronicles chapters 22, 28, and 29, and 2 Chronicles chapters 2 through 7. This temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in approximately 590 B.C. Seventy years later, it was rebuilt under Zerubbabel and Joshua. This second temple was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greco-Syrian ruler. He stuck a pig in the temple an act which prefigured the final desecration to occur under Antichrist as he sets up the abomination of desolation in the tribulation temple, Matthew 24, 15. Now we find that a third temple has been erected. It is probably not the final millennial temple of Ezekiel 40 through 48, but one which is built during the tribulation hour and used sacrilegiously by the beast who claims to be God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. This temple, its altar, and the attendants are Jewish. There is no outer court for Gentiles as there was in past temples. Verse 2, 
the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Notice that this temple has nothing to do with the church, which is already in heaven, chapter 4, verse 1. It is for Jews and Gentiles, not Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. In the second temple, rebuilt and enlarged by Herod the Great in 20 or 21 B.C., the outer court was marked off from the inner one where only Israel was permitted to enter. The courts were separated by the middle wall of partition, Ephesians 2.14. And no Gentile was allowed beyond that point. When the Apostle Paul broke this rule, angry Jews almost killed him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Acts 21, 28. So as John measures the tribulation temple, he is told to omit the outer court, undoubtedly, because Gentiles will trample the holy city, Jerusalem, under their feet for 42 months. Hey, there is no doubt about the literalness of this seven-year period. Daniel's first 69 weeks, Daniel 9, 24 to 26, totaled 483 years. We recall from our discussion in chapter 6 that the term week is heptad, in the original Hebrew and means seven years. Thus, 69 multiplied by seven equals 483 years to the day, Rexella. If this be so, why wouldn't Daniel's final or 70th week also consist of seven years or 2,520 days as well? <laughs> the formula is so clear that a child can grasp it. Watch this. One half of 2,520 is 1,260 days, or 42 months of 30 days each, or three and one half years. Conversely, two times three and one half years equals seven years, or 84 months of 30 days each, or 2,520 days. Don't forget to take into account that the old Jewish calendar contained 12 months of 30 days each, or a total of 360, not the 365 days of modern calendars. Is a seven-year plan scriptural then? We can check for ourselves because the days are mentioned in chapter 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6, as 1260. Likewise, the months are mentioned in chapter 11, verse 2, and chapter 13, verses 5 and 42. Again, we can easily see that 1,260 days multiplied by 2 equals 2,520 days, and that 42 multiplied by 2 equals 84 months, one heptad, or seven years to the day. <laughs> one doesn't have to be a mathematical wizard or a calculus genius to discover that the tribulation is a full seven years in duration. Take it literally. During the final half of the seven years, two witnesses appear. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These two witnesses are God's prophets sent to proclaim His message of doom. They are clothed in sackcloth. In the Bible, sackcloth and ashes always picture repentance, and repentance is demanded when sin stalks a nation. Repentance is God's call to either turn or burn. The witnesses are described in verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Olive trees exude oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Candlesticks are light bearers. Thus, we have a beautiful picture of two chosen witnesses anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming the message of light in the midst of a sin-blackened world. There is no other way to do God's service. Oh, be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. There's been a great deal of discussion concerning the identity of these two witnesses. Most Bible scholars believe that they are 
either Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch. Malachi is explicit in predicting Elijah's future appearance upon earth. He states, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 5. Thus, there is no doubt about Elijah being one of the witnesses. This prediction is corroborated by the fact that Elijah did not die a physical death, but was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind and a chariot of fire, 2 Kings 2, verses 9 to 11. Likewise, Enoch was taken to heaven without experiencing death, Genesis 5, 24 and Hebrews 11, 5. He also prophesied the coming day of God's judgment and the return of Christ with his church, Jude verses 14 and 15. Since Enoch's earthly ministry predated the establishment of the Jewish race, he is considered by some as God's first prophet to the Gentiles. Elijah, on the other hand, was God's prophet to Israel. Thus, since God's witness during the tribulation hours to both groups, many believe the two witnesses to be Elijah and Enoch. Personally, I believe that Moses will be the other witness because he appeared with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, verses 1 to 8. And this is a preview of the glory to come in that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will be the only important one. The preview indicates that when the day finally arrives, Moses and Elijah, also called Elias, representatives of the law and the prophets, will be present undoubtedly as the two witnesses. Concerning Moses, we read, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 19. One should also keep in mind that the body of Moses was preserved by God. Jude 9 declares, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, and durst not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. These witnesses dressed in sackcloth and proclaiming the message of judgment will be hated. Latter-day terrorists will attempt to destroy them. God, however, forbids it and offers sovereign protection. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. This can be nothing but supernatural power and intervention. The fact that the two witnesses have superhuman anointing is evident from... Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn in the blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. One of these two witnesses, Elijah or Elias, performed this very miracle in earlier days. Remember, Elias prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. James chapter 5 verses 17 and 18. Moses, the second witness, had power along with Aaron and his brother to turn the waters into blood and smite the earth with diversified plagues. Exodus 7 to 10. Thus, the tribulation ministry of these two supernaturally anointed prophets will be but a repeat performance. During the entire period of their witness, they cannot be killed. Their death must be at God's appointed time. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Oh, isn't it wonderful to know that nothing, 
can happen to any child of God without the Lord's divine permission. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. That's right. No one can take a believer's life without the permissive will of God. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Job 7, 1. Again, it is appointed that men once to die, Hebrews 9, 27. This is why Christians should always say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that, James 4, 15. At this point, the time of the witnesses testifying ends. God's purpose for his two servants has been completed. They soon will be called home. The method of their release from the body is death at the hands of the beast. His conduct is identical to that of the now deceased Khomeini of Iran, who had the bodies of America's brave servicemen displayed in the streets of Tehran following the April 1980 hostage rescue attempt. His action was one of the most repulsive, repugnant sights ever witnessed. The Antichrist commits the same dastardly deed with the bodies of Moses and Elijah. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Since the Lord was crucified in this city, we know it to be Jerusalem. The term great city is the holy city, Jerusalem, of verse 2. Why then is it called Sodom in Egypt? Because the moral and spiritual conditions that existed in Sodom before its destruction and the idolatrous iniquities that abounded in Egypt before God judged the land are found inundating Jerusalem during this period of time. All the preaching of repentance by the two witnesses in sackcloth does not change the wicked complexion of the city. The death of the two witnesses then is observed by the entire world as evidenced by the next verse, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer or allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. Satellite television beaming the identical image to every nation on earth and into every home equipped with a receiver allows the spectacle to be observed internationally. The action constitutes a victory celebration by the Antichrist similar to Khomeini's televised production. In response, the world rejoices. The two gloom and doom preachers are gone. No longer will two hellfire advocates spoil their tea parties. No longer will their, will their beer and salami festivals be hindered. The witnesses are dead. Dead. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Wait, the party is coming to an end. Their food will soon stick in their throats. A miracle of spectacular proportions is about to occur. Verses 11 and 12. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven on a cloud, and their enemies beheld him. Elijah and Moses received the same treatment as the raptured saints in Revelation 4.1. Hallelujah. They depart for glory in the twinkling of an eye. As this awe-inspiring sight is being observed, God sends judgment for all the sacrilegious acts, the violent, drug-crazed crowds perpetrated on these two servants. Verse 13, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men, seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. <laughs> Talk about a television spectacular, Excella. Two men come to life again and then vanish in a cloud. 
Next, an unprecedented earthquake hits the city and 7,000 celebrities, the interpretation of many scholars, yes, big names among the elite, are killed. This video extravaganza will make the nightly news seem like child's play. Those who live through the experience become exceedingly frightened and begin to praise God. However, it is not from converted hearts that they exalt Him. Instead, their praise is the result of astonishment and alarm. Their reaction is similar to that of the scribes and the Pharisees who witnessed the miracle of the healed paralytic and were all amazed and glorified God and were filled with fear. Luke 5, 26. They didn't get saved, just cared. Some people develop a spiritual vocabulary in a hurry. Wait until atomic bombs begin flying. Prayer and praise will become the order of the day. And it will. Foxhole religion. But listen, we come now to the third woe. Remember the angel in chapter 8, verse 13, who cried, Whoa! 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 Each woe depicted a different judgment. Each in turn became more severe. The first woe was the fifth trumpet blast, the second woe, the sixth trumpet blast. At this point, the final woe, or seventh trumpet, trumpet, is about to sound. Verses 14 and 15, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. The picture before us is the same as the one in chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, the return of the king. If one remembers that chapters 6 through 11 and 12 through 19, verse 15, run concurrently or side by side during the tribulation hour, he'll understand why the king returns both in chapter 11, verse 15, and in chapter 19, verse 16. Chapters 12 through 19, Verse 15 are but a repeat of the events described in chapters 6 through 11. Isn't that simple? Now, as the king returns, a praise and worship service begins. Verse 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. This is an act of gratitude. Remember that the 24 elders represent all believers, Old and New Testament, who have lived on this earth and who have been raptured to heaven in chapter 4, verse 1. They know firsthand that Satan has been the god of this world system, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. They understand fully that the nations of this world have been under his control, Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9. But now, praise God, Satan's reign has finally ended. The king has come. There is great rejoicing in heaven among the raptured saints as the midnight newscast is shared. And they unitedly pray, saying, verse 17, We give thee thanks, O Lord, Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Their prayer is to Christ, the one who used the title, which art and wast and art to come. This event is now an accomplished fact, as we saw in verse 15. The power that was always his has now been embraced, and he has begun his reign. The wicked are upset over the king's return. Verse 18, And the nations were angry, for thy wrath is come in the time for the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Notice the number of happenings which transpire at the king's return. First, the nations are angry. This is also observed in the other text describing the king's descent to earth. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse against his army. Chapter 19, verse 19. Second, the day of God's wrath has come as the king returns. This is the period of time when out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Chapter 19, verse 15. Third, 
at the conclusion of the king's 1,000 year reign, the wicked are judged. The setting is chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Fourth, the faithful prophets and saints, small and great, are rewarded at the end of the 1,000 years. This is not a picture of the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Then, believers were raptured, chapter 4, verse 1, investigated, chapter 4, verse 2, coronated, chapter 4, verse 4, and exalted as they laid their crowns at Jesus' feet, chapter 4, verse 11, long before the tribulation hour ended. The rewards presented at this time are for those who are faithful during the kingdom age, who did not rebel and follow Satan at its conclusion, chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Fifth, those who destroyed the earth are destroyed. This refers to spirit beings who followed the destroyer, Satan. Their destruction is separate from that of the nations, hence the division between the two in verse 18. Satanic beings receive their judgment at this hour as well as the earth dwellers. In the midst of all this, Israel, praise the Lord, is spared. Verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. The temple of God and the Ark of the Testament, both connected with Jewish worship, picture Israel. Thus, in the midst of lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail, God spares His covenant people. Oh, Jack, I'm so glad to know that. I truly am. We're going to continue on right now with the next chapter with these questions. See once again if you can answer them before Jack shares this chapter with us. Who is the mysterious woman described in this chapter? What is the great wonder, a great red dragon that John sees? Is Israel protected from Satan's onslaught? If you say yes, then I want to ask again, by whom? What is the strange war that occurs in heaven? Who are the participants and who wins? What part does the angel Michael play in Israel's past, present, and future? Is the devil a grotesque little gremlin who spends his time stoking a fiery furnace 24 hours a day? I think all of us sort of think of him as having horns and a pitchfork down in hell somewhere. Is he really? What and who are she devils? When does Satan realize time is running out? What pictures the greatest period of anti-Semitic slander in all of history? What act of divine intervention stops this terrible persecution? When is Satan's anger the greatest? All right, Jack, let's begin chapter 12. Okay. As noted previously, chapters 12 through 19 constitute a rerun of the tribulation hour as presented in chapters 6 through 11. Thus, at this point, we come once again to the middle of the tribulation and to the worst wave of anti-Semitism the world's ever observed. This is truly what Jeremiah had in mind in chapter 30, verse 7, when he said, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, as one discovers in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, is Israel. A number of great signs and occurrences are witnessed in this chapter, each having to do with the horrendous judgment that is enveloping the earth, including the persecution being directed against Israel. These include a great wonder, verse 1, a great red dragon, verse 3, great wrath, verse 12, as well as two wings of a great eagle, verse 14. Now, verse 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. In total, the book of Revelation pictures four different women. One, Jezebel, the high priestess of paganism, chapter 2, verse 20. Two, the scarlet woman, the high priestess of apostasy, chapter 17. Three, the lamb's wife, the representative of the true blood-bought church, chapter 19, verse 7. And four, 
Israel in the text before us. This woman of chapter 12 is a picture of Israel. Mary Baker Eddy Glover Patterson Fry presented herself as this woman, but her claim was absurd, <laughs> to say the least. The woman's offspring could not possibly be the Christian science movement. Who then is this woman and why does she appear? The term wonder in our text comes from the same Greek word sign. Thus we see that the woman is a sign. What sign? The sign of Israel. Let's prove this assertion. The woman of Revelation 12, 1 was pictured in the dream of Joseph centuries ago. I quote, And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream. And behold, the sun and the moon, representing his father and mother, and the eleven stars, representing Joseph's eleven brothers, made obeisance to me, the twelfth star. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brothers envied him. But his father observed the saying, Genesis 37, verses 9 to 11. Clearly, the woman clothed with the sun and wearing a crown of 12 stars upon her head, just like in Joseph's dream, is Israel. The birth of this woman's, Israel's son, is predicted in Isaiah 66, verses 7 and 8. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? <clears throat> For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children or her son. Isaiah's prediction finds its fulfillment in the next verse. Verse 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Here we have the mother Israel bringing forth a man-child who is none other than the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, as one discovers in verse 5. This truth harmonizes with many New Testament texts. For instance, Romans 9, verses 4 and 5 state, They are Israelites. Watch this. To whom predeneth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. Christ in his flesh came forth from Israel. And at this point in our text, Christ's adversary, Satan, the one who rebelled centuries ago against the authority of God, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, is about to strike another blow. Verses 3 and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The red dragon is conclusively proven to be Satan in verse 9. The number seven speaks of completeness, and therefore the dragon's seven heads picture his wisdom. It is written that Satan, think of it, is full of wisdom. Ezekiel 28, 12. God created him that way when he was the anointed cherub, or angel that covereth, Ezekiel 28, 14. His ten horns speak of universal power, just as the ten toes of Daniel's image do. Satan's international control, of course, is possible because millions of demons jump at his command. Remember, he is the God of this world system, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He is also the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2, and the prince of this world, John 12.31. However, since he is not omniscient, all-knowing, or omnipresent in all places at all times, Satan must rely on demonic hosts, fallen angels, in diversified places to administer his power. This explains why Christians are not fighting against flesh and blood only, but against spirit, wickedness in high places as well, Ephesians 6, 12. 
Satan probably enlisted the angels who fell at the time of his rebellion when his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, a reference to angels, and it cast them to the earth. The similar reference is found in Jude 13. At this point, one may ask why we use these texts to discuss past, present, and future history. The answer is simple. The scene we're about to witness speaks of the entire age-long conflict from beginning to end. Its details are squeezed into these few verses before us. The same devil who attempted to destroy the woman's or Israel's son in centuries past, Genesis 3.15, is now about to strike out against the woman herself via the greatest anti-Semitic purge in history. Hitler's murderous and barbaric attempt at Jewish annihilation will seem like a Sunday school picnic compared to this Holocaust. That's why Daniel stated, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 21 and 22, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The elect here are the Israelites of Romans 11, 28. Verse 5 proves my earlier statement that the verses before us cover the age-long conflict, past, present, and future. For she brought forth a man-child past, 1900 years ago, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, future, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne, the present age of grace. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared to God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. During this final 42-month period, described as the Great Tribulation, Revelation 7, 14, because of its intensity and immensity, the children of Israel are protected by their God. Hey, he took care of them for 40 years as they wandered through the wilderness, and now he again proves his love to his ancient people by delivering them. Yes, they shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Again, and at that time thy people shall be delivered. Daniel 12, 1. Matthew 24, 22 adds, For the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. In the next few verses, a shocking space war takes place. That's right. Verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Some Bible authorities believe that this war in heaven began at the time of the rapture in chapter 4, verse 1. Since a war involves a number of skirmishes or battles, this is a distinct possibility. The assumption is based on Daniel 12, 1 and 2. These scholars reason that since those who are caught up in the rapture of the church must pass through the areas where Satan reigns, the aerial and stellar heavens, Satan becomes aroused and attempts to hinder this evacuation of the saints from the earth. However, as he attempts to interfere in this glorious event, Angels, ministers of the saints, Hebrews 1.14, rush to the rescue, and the space confrontation and conflagration begins. This happened in the past. Why couldn't it occur again? Where did it happen in the past? Consider with me Daniel 10. In verse 13, we are introduced to Michael, the commander-in-chief of heaven's armies. Daniel says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, an angelic name and title, came to help me. God tells Daniel that he had every intention of answering his prayers, but that for 21 days the devil tried to hinder the response. Finally, 
God had to send Michael to battle the devil in the area of his domain, the first and second heavens, in order to make the answer a reality. Thus, it is possible that Michael will again battle God's adversary at the time of the rapture in order to allow Christians their entrance into the glory and the twinkling of an eye as promised in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Now, Michael is mentioned five times in God's Word, beginning with Daniel 10, 13. We find him again in Daniel 10, 21, where he is described to the children of Israel as Michael, your prince. His third mention is in Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. In Jude, verse 9, we find Michael, the archangel, contending with the devil over the body of Moses. Notice that every time Michael appears, he's connected with the children of Israel making it very plausible that he is at war with Satan in our present and fifth text, defending the Jewish people. The war is on, and it is the greatest aerial combat in history. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Satan and the dragon fought in his angels. Are you shocked to discover Satan in heaven? Most people, including many Christians, <laughs> Imagine him as a little creature dressed in a red uniform, running around with a pitchfork, jabbing his victims in a place called hell. This is a lot of mythological nonsense. Satan is a magnificent creature to behold. In fact, his beauty brought his ruin, Ezekiel 28, 17 states. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Not only is it a lie to picture Satan as a grotesque monstrosity, but it is equally false to place him in hell. He's never been there. He's the God of the world system, the prince of the power of the air, and the prince of this world, as we have already observed. He has been in heavens one and two, the aerial and stellar heavens, since his fall. And he will remain there until he is cast to the earth, in verse 9. It is also important to note that he is not cast into eternal hell, the lake of fire, to join those. He is duped until after the millennium, chapter 20, verse 10. Now, as this battle is fought, Satan is defeated. Praise God, Rexella. Satan is mighty, but God is almighty. Satan can destroy, but God can destroy the destroyer. That's why the Christian should never fear the events of daily life. He has victory in Jesus. Yes, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. Satan's demise began when he was cast out of the third heaven, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, continues until Revelation 12, 9, when he is cast out of the first and second heavens, and is completed when he is cast into the lake of fire, chapter 20, verse 10. Jesus foresaw that hour and said, The prince of this world shall be cast out, John 12, 31. And again, the prince of this world is judged, John 16, 11. To the eternal Christ, Satan's doom was as good as accomplished. But for you and me, time had to pass. Now, in our text, the moment has arrived. Satan and his angels prevailed not, verse 8. Michael's gunners zero in, and Satan's place an abiding location for centuries is found no longer. Instead, the dragon, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, is cast out into the earth, and his angels are cast out with him. This signals the end of Satan's rule in the aerial and stellar heavens, and the victory celebration begins. All oh, heaven rejoices over that which Michael's defeat of Satan has accomplished. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The spontaneous praise session Within this verse occurs because one, salvation from Satan's atmospheric control has taken place. Two, God's strength has crushed Satan's might. Three, the kingdom is about to arrive. And four, the power of Christ will be seen as he comes to set up his kingdom. Think of it. The united power of father and son cast the accuser of the brethren out of the heavens. 
say, Did you know that accusing the brethren is Satan's present ministry? He also uses some ministers and holier-than-thou church members to accomplish this goal. Listen carefully. Every bit of slander against another brother or sister in Christ is simply the devil using an individual's mind and vocal cords. In fact, devil means slanderer. The term false accuser in the English Bible is translated from the word diabolus or devil. Thus, Titus 2.3 states that the aged women likewise be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. Oh, Rex, all this is good. Literally rendered, this verse states that the aged women be not she-devils. A woman gospel is a she-devil and a male gossip a macho devil. <laughs> Both are controlled by the power of the vile one. No wonder lying is one of the seven sins God hates in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Well, back to the point. When Satan is cast out into the earth, verse 9, the hot spot will be our terra firma, where men walk and breathe. At that time, there will be only one place of safety and victory in the arms of the Lord Jesus through his shed blood. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Notice these wise saints resisted Satan by the blood of Jesus and by the word of God. There is no other way to win a spiritual battle, Hebrews 4.12. They also overcame Satan by their testimony and loved not their own lives unto death. What a crown awaits them and you if you're true blue. Thus John states in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Though there's rejoicing in the heavenlies, the picture is quite different for earth dwellers. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. At this point, Satan unleashes all his fury, for he knows that within 42 months, three and one half years, his reign will be ended. Thus, the greatest anti-Semitic purge begins. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman Israel, which brought forth the man-child. Immediately, God intervenes. Verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, one year, and times two years, and half a time, one half year, from the face of the serpent. This verse describes God in His sovereignty and love, protecting His chosen people for three and one half years. The eagle's wings probably indicate an airlift or some other miraculous speedy escape. God is probably reminding the children of Israel of His act of preservation in Pharaoh's day, and uses the picture of wings to show them his goodness. He declares, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Exodus 19.4 Safety is promised to his people. Verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The flood undoubtedly portrays a volume of propaganda, anti-Semitic insinuations, slanders, and slurs released internationally. Yet, God promises when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, 15. Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. This verse, too, is reminiscent of the miraculous deliverance God provided the children of Israel during their exodus from Egypt when the Red Sea closed in over Pharaoh and his army. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. 
Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee in glorious and holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Exodus 15, verses 9 to 12. Whew, that's good. At this point, Satan reaches the height of his anger. Verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jack, I am thoroughly enjoying the study of the book of Revelation. And as we proceed on to chapter 13, there are some of the most important questions in all of Revelation that I have for you. See if you can answer them before we get into this all-important chapter. Why are there two world leaders in this chapter, and what do they signify? What do the seven heads and ten horns typify? What was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and how significant is it for our day? When will the Roman Empire be revived, and does it signal the end of time? Why are 13 nations mentioned when only 10 horns are prophesied in the Bible? Who is the stone cut out without hands? Could the common market be the final piece in God's puzzle? What four empires ruled the world in the past 2,500 years? Now, all of you history buffs know that one. Could the Antichrist duplicate Christ's resurrection, and will it happen? Who was called the son of perdition? Is globalism or a new world order coming? Did you know that's in the Bible? Where does the false prophet get such extraordinary power to work miracles? Will an image of the Antichrist actually speak? The image speak? Can we know right now who the Antichrist is or will be? And what does 666 mean? Now, we've been asked these questions many, many times, Jack. You've been asked them many times. Now, enlighten us with chapter 13, will you? I first of all want to say that if one understands Revelation chapter 13, he knows exactly what the future holds. So let's look into it. This chapter introduces us to two beasts. The first one, commonly known as the Antichrist, is unveiled in verses 1 through 10, while the second beast, known as the false prophet, is revealed in verses 11 through 18. The first beast is political. The second is religious. Both, however, are energized by the power of Satan and thus constitute an unholy trinity, the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Remember, Satan is the great imitator. The incarnation of himself in these two villains is his final attempt to wreak havoc upon earth. Knowing that he has but a short time left, he makes an all-out move to usurp God's position and authority through his two allies, the beasts of this chapter. Verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. As stated earlier in our study, chapters and verses came into existence in the 1500s. They are very helpful in locating passages, but they are not inspired as God's Word is. At times, they even becloud the information being presented. Actually, verse 1 of chapter 13 should have been part of chapter 12, for the subject is Satan and his persecution of earth dwellers. Therefore, according to the original Greek manuscript, the personal pronoun should be he instead of I, because he pictures Satan standing upon the sand of the sea. Accordingly, this portion of Scripture should read, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and Satan stood upon the sand of the sea. Satan standing upon the sand of the sea pictures his control over earth's teeming millions, at an appointed time, chapter 17, verse 5, and chapter 20, verse 8. This control is established for the two satanically inspired beasts who come out of the sea and the earth. The first beast, the Antichrist, rises out of the sea and has seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. He is a literal man, but demon-possessed, for he or his power comes out of the abyss. 
for the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, chapter 17, verse 8. The seven heads loaded with blasphemy also portrayed the five kings who had ruled up to John's day, the sixth king who was in power at the time, and the seventh king who will reign as the Antichrist during the tribulation hour. Chapter 17, verse 10 confirms this. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Likewise, the ten horns also picture ten nations over whom the beast or antichrist rules, as we shall discover in a moment. At this point, however, we can state that the scene before us pictures the final or seventh world leader ruling over a confederation of ten nations during the end time. In order to understand that the ten horns are actually ten western nations, each of which was part of the old Roman Empire, one must study the prophecy of Daniel in chapters 2 and 7 of the book bearing his name. Let's digress for a moment and investigate. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon in Daniel's day, had a dream. When he awakened, however, he could not recall the dream. Therefore, he called his magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers together, requesting that they both recall the dream and explain its meaning. Not one of them was able to do so, even under the sentence of death. Hear the report. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel 2, verses 13, 16, and 19. Next, we find Daniel in the presence of the king explaining God's vision to him in verses 27 through 36. This is one of the most important texts in the entire Bible because it reveals the history of the world from that time to our present day. Listen carefully. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, and what should come to pass here after. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till another stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Nebuchadnezzar was astonished as his dream was revealed and shocked as its interpretation was given. Daniel told the king, that he, Nebuchadnezzar, as the leader of the Babylonian Empire, was the head of gold, and that the two arms of silver, representing the Medes and the Persians, would soon overthrow him. Next, the stomach and thighs of brass, Greece, would defeat the Medes and the Persians. Eventually, the two legs of iron, the Roman Empire, headquartered at Rome and Constantinople, would conquer the Greco Empire. These events occurred exactly as God had revealed him to Daniel, as he in turn told Nebuchadnezzar. Now notice something extremely important. The ten toes of iron and clay never destroyed the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. Why? Rome fell through internal corruption. 
This historical fact is the subject of Edward Gibbon's great book, The History of the Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Therefore, we see that the final world power is a union of ten Western nations presented by the ten toes of the great image. The iron tells us that these nations were part of the old Roman Empire, whereas the clay speaks of a deterioration as the empire weakened over the centuries. Thus, the final world power will not be communism, but a confederation of ten Western nations under the first beast or the Antichrist. The ten toes also coincide with the ten horns of the beast in the verse under consideration. In the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel 2, 36 to 44, Daniel describes the toes as kingdoms, concluding with a statement, and in the days of these kings, ten of them, as pictured by the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For centuries, Christians have prayed, Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come. During the tribulation hour, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists of Revelation chapter 7, verses 3 to 8, will preach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the king is about to return. Can you hear them shouting this exciting information in the streets? The king is coming! The king is coming! Finally, the king is seen returning in chapter 11, verse 15, and chapter 19, verse 16. And this event of the ages takes place when a final confederation of ten, ten Western nations has been established upon earth. Could the present European economic community or common market be a part of this picture? Oh, I believe it could be. Jesus is coming soon. At this point, we need to consider another extremely important fact. Ireland and Denmark, present common market members, were never part of the old Roman Empire. This apparent problem, however, is quickly resolved when one considers the information presented in Daniel 7. Here we discover that following the establishment of a ten-nation confederacy, another world leader arises. He takes control, ousts three nations, and replaces them with two others and his own. Specifically, Daniel says, I considered the horns, ten of them, and behold, there came up among them the ten, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns, the original members, plucked up by the roots. Chapter 7, verse 8. This coincides perfectly with Revelation 13, 5. Daniel continues in verses 24 and 25, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Wait and another shall rise after them. He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. Here we not only see the world leader overpowering three kings and replacing them with original members of the old Roman Empire, we also observe him fulfilling the prediction of blasphemy described in our text. There's no doubt about it. A confederacy of ten Western nations will be formed. Then another leader will appear, remove three nations, replace them, and rule as the Antichrist until the King of Kings returns to earth and destroys his evil empire. Thus, common market will grow to 13 nations, and these 13 could eventually control all nations, the new world order, and finally be reduced to ten at the end when this ten-toed, ten-horned confederacy is destroyed. This is the event described by Daniel as a stone cut out without hands, breaking in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Then Daniel 2, 44 and 45 occurs. In the days of these kings, get it, oh, the final ten. Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these ten kingdoms, and it, Christ's kingdom, shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great 
God hath made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. Yes, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream has come to pass throughout hundreds of years of history, and the present alignment of Western nations in the form of the European economic community may well be the final piece in the puzzle. Prepare to meet thy God. Amos 4.12. Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave me his power and his seat and great authority. We've already discovered that one, Babylon, two, Medio Persia, three, Greece, and four, Rome, constitute the four empires of world history. We've also learned that the revived Roman Empire in the form of a final ten-nation confederation becomes the end of time power block. Daniel 7 pictures these four empires as one, a lion, two, a bear, three, a leopard, and four, a beast who is a combination of the previous world leaders he's conquered. The beast empire contains a portion of each preceding empire. Actually, the only difference between the descriptions of John and Daniel is that the order is reversed in the book of Revelation. The reason for this is simple. John is looking back to the beginning, while Daniel is looking forward to the conclusion. Putting it all together, the message of the ten horns, the ten toes, and the four beasts is one and the same from different vantage points. In all picture, a world dictator governing ten nations at the time of the end. This ten-nation confederacy constitutes the revival of the fourth power, the old Roman Empire, as typified by the fourth monstrous animal or beast. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The wounding of the beast is mentioned three times in this chapter, verses 3, 12, and 14. The wound produces death, but restoration to life follows. Some commentators think that this statement represents the fall of the old Roman Empire and its restoration through the Ten Nation Confederacy. Others believe that it speaks of the resurrection of Judas Iscariot, for he and the Antichrist are the only ones ever called the son of perdition. John 17, 12 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. God alone knows. But wait, a third possibility would be that the Antichrist is assassinated midway through the tribulation hour, perhaps in retaliation for overthrowing three members of the original ten-nation federation. Such an event would give the great counterfeiter Satan the opportunity to perform a resurrection. This would prove invaluable to the prestige of the Antichrist since the deity of the Lord Jesus was affirmed by his resurrection 2,000 years before, Matthew 12, 39, and 40. Remember that the Antichrist proclaims himself God and even sits in the temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, and Matthew 24, 15. Thus, a resurrection would assure the world that he is all he claims to be. Rexala, I personally believe this to be the correct solution because when it happens, all the world wonders after him. Mankind is literally overwhelmed by the Antichrist's power and authority. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Another reason that verse 3 may speak of an actual resurrection is the fact that millions who previously would not believe in the Antichrist now begin to worship him and Satan. In the second half of this chapter, we'll see that the false prophet or religious leader of the tribulation period actually enforces the worship of the Antichrist. Since the people think of him as God, they cry, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Yes, who can combat this self-proclaimed God and be victorious? Verse 5, 
And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. The Antichrist blasphemy during the final three and one half years of the tribulation hour most likely has to do with his mockery of the Almighty. One of the reasons God hates idolatry, the use of images and worship, is that he wants no rivals. Hear Jehovah in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. One of the commandments, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Think of the insult to the Eternal One when the Antichrist says, I am God, and teeming millions bow to Him, to Satan, to the false prophet, and to the image, the abomination of desolation erected in His honor. This blasphemy continues. Verse 6, And He opened His mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme His name in His tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Jesus, the true God, was accused of blasphemy in his day because he claimed to be God. Matthew 9, 3. Ironically, the world accepts the Antichrist claim to deity, and this perpetrated lie is blasphemy to God. The blasphemy is undoubtedly intensified because Satan himself is speaking. Now, here's a thought-provoking theory. During the first 42 months of the tribulation, the Antichrist acts under the influence of Satan. However, after Satan is cast out of heaven in chapter 12 and comes to earth, he may actually incarnate himself in the dead body of the Antichrist, who had the wound by a sword and did live. Verse 14. Thus the beast is raised from the dead by the counterfeiter, Satan, who dwells in his body for the final two months, claiming deity. Hmm. As a result, he is able to experience that which he sought when he was cast out of heaven, crying, I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. Satan's ultimate desire is now realized. He's worshipped as God. The blasphemy is unspeakable. He desecrates everything his filthy hands touch, including the tabernacle and its worshipers. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The fight is on for the saints of the tribulation hour. Remember, this is not the church. Satan battles the church as they return with Christ, chapter 19, verse 14. In the scene before us, he is attempting to destroy the millions who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, chapter 7, verse 14, and who also refused the mark of the beast, chapter 20, verse 4. Instead of experiencing defeat, they overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, chapter 12, verse 11. During this time, the Antichrist controls the entire world. He is an international despot exercising power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Such a one world government is almost upon us. Consider for a moment the global organizations which have become existent in our day. Rex Heller, this is amazing. One, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Two, the International Labor Organization. Three, the Food and Agricultural Organization. Four, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or World Bank. Five, the International Development Association. Six, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, commonly called UNESCO. Seven, the World Health Organization. Eight, the International Finance Corporation. Nine, the International Monetary Fund. Ten, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Doesn't end. Eleven, the Universal Postal Union. Twelve, the International Telecommunications Union. Thirteen, the World Meteorological Association. Fourteen, the Intergovernmental Maritime Consultative Organization. And fifteen, the General Agreement on Tariffs 
and Trades Organization. <laughs> the formation of such international alliances has led outstanding thinkers to state that a new world order is on the horizon. Presently, we may be witnessing mankind's final approach to the much publicized new world order or one world government of the Antichrist. Then, at this point in history, all the world will be amazed as this self-styled deity takes control and the majority submit to his authority. However, God always has a remnant who will not bow to Baal or other deities. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The true believers of the tribulation hour will have nothing to do with this satanic monster, even though they will not be able to buy or sell without his approval. Chapter 13, verse 17. Their love for Christ will mean more than life, shelter, and food. They will love Christ to the end. For John declares, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Chapter 20, verse 4. Is the tribulation hour approaching? Will a demon-possessed or devil incarnate human claim deity and be accepted as world leader and worshiped as God? I believe so. Why? Henry Spock, a spokesman for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, SWIFT, in Brussels, Belgium, headquarters for Common Market, made a profound statement relevant to that organization's goals and operations a few years ago. This is shocking. He said, I'm going to go slowly, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of the people and lift us out of the economic morass into which we're sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, God or devil, we will accept him. Mr. Spock, your wish will soon become a reality. The life and death matter of verses 1 through 8 is so important that God repeats the warning he so often presented to the seven churches. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Beware. Take heed. Think seriously. Why? Verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. This is the exact caution Paul stressed in Galatians 6, 7. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, identifying him with Christianity. And he spake as a dragon, tying him in with Satan. Verses 11 through 18 introduce us to the second beast, the religious fake or false prophet, who is the third member of the satanic trinity. The devil imitates the father, the antichrist imitates the son, and the false prophet imitates the Holy Spirit. This religious hypocrite fulfills the prediction of the Savior who said in Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Clearly, the power of the false prophet is in the realm of religion. He is co 
equal in power with the Antichrist. One heads up the secular world while the other controls the religious scene. These two work closely together. The Antichrist shares his authority with the false prophet, protecting him and his religious colossus in return for a promise of loyalty and devotion. Thus, as the head of the world church, the false prophet sees to it that the Antichrist, who was wounded and resurrected, is worshipped. What a team! This second beast is also one of the greatest miracle workers in history. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven, on the earth in the sight of men. These great wonders are called lying wonders in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. They are not magical, sleight of hand manipulations, but the result of supernatural power from the dragon who enables these men to even produce fire. Since God often revealed himself by fire, Genesis 19, 24, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, and 1 Kings 18, 33, the false prophet also uses fire. Satan shares his supernatural power for one reason, verse 14, to deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. The sole purpose of all these miracles is to prepare the people for idolatry. The false prophet actually entices mankind to build the greatest statue in history in the very image of the Antichrist. This monstrosity will be erected in Jerusalem and will be placed in the Jewish temple. Such a blasphemous act is against the Jewish conscience and is forbidden by the second commandment, Exodus 20, verse 4, already quoted. This is why the image is such an obnoxious, hateful, and abominable thing and is labeled the abomination of desolation by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, 15. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Since the image is able to speak, it might well be the ultimate achievement of our present day computer systems already capable of conducting intelligent conversations. Professor Seymour Wolfson of Wayne State University in Detroit is an expert in the field of computers. He states, already there is a report of computer systems that have the storage capability of 10 trillion, not million, not billion, 10 trillion human beings, end of quote. Personally, I believe that the Antichrist will enslave and control Earth's four or five billion inhabitants through such an all-knowing, monstrous computer. Such a system is absolutely essential to his having all the facts and every member of the human race at his fingertips. As a result, he will with unerring precision be able to know who receives his orders, obeys his commands, and honors his laws. His computer will also tell him who Earth's rebels are how efficient are modern computers? Computer Digest states, in one half second, today's computers can debit 2,000 checks to 300 different bank accounts or can examine 1,000 electrocardiograms or score 150,000 answers on 3,000 exams or figure the company payroll for 1,000 employees in one half second. Amazing. The Antichrist will most certainly use such a computer and it will be fashioned in his own image. Verses 16 to 18, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number six hundred three score and six. 
As we have seen, the Antichrist will undoubtedly use a computer to enslave Earth's population during the tribulation hour. Also, we discover that he will affect and maintain this control through commerce, the buying and selling of products. In order to make his plan operable, the Antichrist will also introduce an international identification system in the form of a mark, possibly a laser tattoo, placed in the right hand or forehead of every individual participant. Without this mark, no man, no man will be permitted to purchase or sell even the smallest item of merchandise. According to verses 17 and 18, this identification mark will be or include as a prefix the digits 666. The use of 666 as a prefix appears most plausible, as this is the only way one person could be differentiated from another. If all numbers were identical, mass confusion would ensue. Therefore, prefixes preceding the 666 or the 666 as the prefix code are essential for marketing purposes. With specific reverence to verse 18, one should be aware of the fact that there have always been and will always be individuals who claim to know the identity of the Antichrist. They take the number 666 and through all kinds of mathematical formulations attempt to come to a conclusion. Their efforts, however, can amount to no more than mere speculation because we cannot know who the Antichrist is until he arrives on the scene, and he cannot arrive until the church is raptured. <laughs> Still, God's Word admonishes the Christian to be wise, Matthew 10, 16, and watchful, Matthew 24, 42, especially as the day of Christ's return approaches, Hebrews 10, 25. As shocking as the information presented in this chapter may seem, such a day is at hand. A cashless, checkless society is in the planning stages and numbers of countries are already experimenting. To be sure, it's later than you think. The reign of the Antichrist is upon the horizon. This new Hitler with a monstrous computer which will enslave millions, may soon control the earth. Unbeliever, seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Isaiah 55, 16. Jack, what an intense and wonderful chapter that is. Thank you so much for explaining it to us. And now to go on to chapter 14. Here are your questions. Who is the Lamb on Mount Zion? Why is Jerusalem so dear to Almighty God? When will Jerusalem become the capital of the world and who will rule at that time? Is there singing during this time of calamity? Verse number five, who are the virgins described in this chapter? What is spiritual adultery? How dangerous is it to lie? What is the everlasting gospel? Is religious unity always right? Who is suffering and why, when, and I'm going to quote, their smoke ascendeth up forever and forever. What is the Shekinah or glory cloud associated with Christ? When does God say enough and begin to use a sickle? What 200 mile area is soaked with blood and is Russia involved in this catastrophe? Chapter 14, Jack. Okay. Chapter 14 deals with the seven visions, each complete in itself. They're not presented in a chronological sequence of events, but rather panoramically with details following later. Let me illustrate this point. The pronouncement of doom upon Babylon, for instance, is uttered in verse 8. However, the details are presented in chapter 16, verses 17 to 21. With this point in mind, let's investigate verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. 
The Lamb, as we already know, is the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist called him by this name as he saw the Lord walking upon earth, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Also, John sees the tribulation saints overcoming Satan by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12, 11. This same Lamb and his bride are the honored participants at a marriage feast conducted in chapter 19, verse 7, which states, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The wedding occurs in heaven, but the feast, probably, takes place on earth as the Lamb returns to Mount Zion or Zion for his millennial reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This would fulfill scores of Old Testament prophecies. Say, did you know that Zion or Jerusalem is the place God seems to love most? Today's anti-Zionists should take heed. They are opposing the Almighty Himself as they rebel against His city and His people. Because I repeat, Jerusalem is closest to God's heart. Psalm 132, verses 13, 14, 17, and 18 state, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Now, while the first verse of chapter 14 is the only place where Zion is mentioned in the book of Revelation, it nevertheless authenticates an unlimited number of Old Testament passages that point to Jerusalem as the headquarters of Christ's earthly kingdom. Seemingly, God is saying through this text, I know that millions are following the Antichrist. I see that the false prophet is scoring many victories as he, through lying wonders and deceits, turns the hearts of multitudes to the super deceiver. However, 666 is the number of a man of incompleteness. It will soon end. Why? I have set my King Jesus upon my holy hill of Zion or Jerusalem. Psalm 2.6. God adds, Though horrendous judgments are about to fall, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. My son, the Lamb, is about to come forth and take his proper position on earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. He shall soon arrive at Jerusalem. The prophet Zechariah also stated this same truth. Hear him. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Zechariah 14.4. Additional verses depicting the establishment of Christ's earthly kingdom includes Psalm 48 too. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Psalm 76 too. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Jerusalem. Psalm 102, 13, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Jerusalem. Psalm 110, 2 pictures his reign and states, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Jerusalem. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Again, the Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion or Jerusalem, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 146, 10. As he reigns, the people are pleased and cry, Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Psalm 149, 2. Isaiah the prophet predicted this time of peace. He said, Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. 
Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. What a day that'll be when Jesus is here and there'll be no more war, no more death or sorrow.